The tragedy that befell the HMS Barham on November 25, 1941, will eternally stain the dark depths of the Mediterranean Sea. It was a strong British vessel, yet, in a matter of minutes, it fell to the ocean below, taking 862 troops with it. The loss of the HMS Barham was a crushing blow to Britain and her allies, since the ship represented the power and pride of England throughout World War II. So, what went wrong? How did the tragic sinking of the HMS Barham come about? What made the HMS Barham a royal war machine? Who won the Battle of Jutland? What role did the Barham play during the Second World War? Stay with us and find out. The battleship HMS Barham was constructed in the early 1910s, along with four other ships of the Queen Elizabeth class for the Royal Navy. She was completed in 1915 and served as a flagship during the First World War, including at the Battle of Jutland. Her duty for the remainder of the war consisted of regular patrols and training in the North Sea, with the exception of an unsuccessful encounter that occurred on August 19, 1916. The vessel served in the Atlantic, Mediterranean, and home fleets throughout the 1920s and 1930s. As a minor figure, Barham also helped put down the Palestine riots of 1929 and the Arab insurrection of 1936 to 1939. In the middle of 1940, she took part in the Battle of Dakar when she slightly damaged a battleship belonging to Vichy France and was slightly wounded herself. Barham was later sent to the Mediterranean fleet, where she was in charge of many Malta convoys. At the Battle of Cape Matapan in March 1941, she assisted in sinking an Italian heavy cruiser and a destroyer. The Barham was an absolute war machine, and all this was due to its creative design and structure. The Queen Elizabeth-class ships were basically intended to create a rapid squadron for the fleet that would operate against the enemy battle line's leading ships. This needed the highest possible offensive strength and a speed many knots higher than any other battleship to ensure their victory. The total dimensions of the Barham were 643 feet 9 inches, 90 feet 7 inches in width, and 33 feet in depth. She displaced 32,590 long tons while not under load and 33,260 long tons when fully loaded. The vessel was powered by steam from 24 Yarrow boilers that fed two sets of Brown Curtis steam turbines that turned two shafts each. The highest speed the turbines were designed to propel the ship to was 25 knots, or 46.3 kilometers per hour. During her brief sea trials, Barham averaged only 23.91 knots, or 44.28 kilometers per hour. At 12 knots, the ship could go 9,260 kilometers before refueling, which was amazing. In 1916, she had a crew of 1,016 people, including officers and other crew members. As part of the 1912 Navy plan, John Brown and company received the contract for Barham, which included the construction of a ship of the Queen Elizabeth class. On February 24, 1913, the foundation was laid at their Clydebank shipyard for the ship that would be named after Admiral Charles Middleton, 1st Lord of Barham. The overall cost of the Barham was £2,470,113. Under Captain Arthur Craig Waller's direction, she was finished with trials on August 19, 1915, which lasted until the end of September. On November 2nd, Barham joined the Grand Fleet at Scapa Flow, and from November 2nd to 5th, she took part in a fleet training exercise west of Orkney. On December 3rd, during another training exercise in early December, the ship was rammed by her sister ship, HMS Warspite. As the repairs to Barham's hull were completed temporarily at Scapa, the ship was transferred to Cromarty Firth's floating dry dock for more extensive repairs. On February 26, 1916, the Grand Fleet set off on tour in the North Sea. John Jellicoe had planned to utilize the Harwich Force to sweep the Heligoland Bight, but the bad weather prohibited operations in the Southern North Sea. For this reason, the operation could only take place in the northern part of the ocean. On March 6, another sweep was initiated, 
but it was called off the next day because the weather had become too severe for the destroyers that were accompanying the lead ships. As Beatty's battlecruisers and other light forces raided the German Zeppelin base at Tondern on the night of March 25th, Barham and the rest of the fleet set out from Scapa Flow to support the operation. On March 26th, while the Grand Fleet was approaching the region, the British and German troops had already withdrawn and a heavy storm was threatening the light craft, so they were sent back to base. The Grand Fleet staged a spectacle off Horn's Reef on April 21st to divert the Germans as the Russian Navy redrew its defensive minefields in the Baltic Sea. On April 24th, the fleet returned to Scapa Flow for fuel before continuing south in response to information that the Germans were planning a strike on Lostoft. Vice Admiral David Beatty's battlecruiser fleet was reinforced by the 5th Battle Squadron ahead of the rest of the Grand Fleet, but the British arrived after the Germans had retreated. There was no larger naval battle during World War I than the one on May 31st and June 1st. This battle was known as the Battle of Jutland. The German high seas fleet was led by Admiral Reinhard Scheer, while the British Grand Fleet was under the direction of Admiral Sir John Jellicoe. HMS Barham was an important British warship that helped turn the tide of the fight. HMS Barham was one of four Queen Elizabeth-class battleships that made up the 5th Battle Squadron during the Battle of Jutland. The squadron was stationed in support of the Grand Fleet's advanced scouting unit, the 3rd Battlecruiser Squadron. At around 2.20 p.m. on May 31st, the Brits saw the German high seas fleet as it headed out to launch an attack on the British shoreline. With orders to go towards the Germans, the 5th Battle Squadron swung to port and followed the Grand Fleet's route. The commander of HMS Barham, Hugh Evan Thomas, misunderstood the order at first and assumed they should turn to starboard, but then he realized his error and directed the ship to make a left turn. Nearing each other, the British and German ships opened fire at approximately 4 p.m. The German battleship SMS Mark Graf, firing on the British battlecruisers, was HMS Barham's initial objective. Barham launched two mortar rounds at Mark Graf, but the distance was too vast and the rounds were missed. Then, by 4.20 p.m., Barham located the German warship SMS Seydlitz and opened fire. The first shot missed, but the second struck the rear gun of Seydlitz, setting it on fire. Another round from Barham struck Seydlitz's bridge, resulting in significant deaths. The German vessel, however, escaped with little damage and was brought back to port for maintenance. The 5th Battle Squadron had already gotten too far behind the Grand Fleet to participate in the main battle. By 6.30 p.m., however, Evan Thomas got instructions to rejoin the battle line, which was at that point fighting the German battleships in a violent artillery conflict. The German ships SMS Westfalen and SMS Frankfurt, both battleships, aimed their guns at Barham as she sailed near the front lines. Westfalen missed their fire at Barham, while Frankfurt's 210mm shell made it through the ship's armor and burst in the ship's boiler room. The explosion did significant damage and 26 crew members lost their lives. But even this damage didn't stop Barham from making it to the front lines, where she eventually fired around into the German battleship SMS Koenig. As a result of the fire's impact on Koenig's bridge, several people, including the captain, were injured or killed. Throughout the night, Barham engaged the German fleet, shooting at multiple targets and evading torpedoes from German destroyers. She nearly dodged a torpedo launched by the warship SMS G-39, which passed only 30 yards behind her. The Germans still managed to win the Battle of Jutland tactically, despite the fact that their total casualties were higher. During World War II, Barham was still serving in the Mediterranean fleet. On December 1st, she changed hands from the government to a private owner and set sail from Alexandria to join the home fleet. In dense fog on December 12th, nine miles west of the Malkin Tire, she collided with one of her own escorts, the destroyer Duchess. As a result of the Duchess's sinking, 124 people lost their lives. On December 28th, the German submarine U-30, commanded by Fritz Julius Lemp, discovered the British warships Barham and battlecruiser Repulse 
and the destroyers Fame, Icarus, Emojid, Isis, and Nubian as they patrolled off the butt of Lewis to prevent a breakout into the Atlantic by German vessels. One of the four torpedoes that Lemp launched at the two capital ships hit Barham on the port side, close to where the shell chambers for the A and B guns were located. The anti-torpedo bulge was almost damaged in the aftermath of the hit, with four personnel dead and two injured. Most of the surrounding compartments flooded, and the ship developed a seven-degree list, mitigated by moving fuel oil to starboard. After lowering her speed to ten knots, Barham could still sail under her own power to Birkenhead, where Kamel Laird repaired her. After this, Captain Jeffrey Cook took over as commander, and the Navy used the time to improve the Barham even more. Some of Barham's crew, Marines, served in the Norwegian campaign, although she played no significant role. The ship was separated from the home fleet on August 28th and sent to Force M, the Royal Navy's component of Operation Menace, to participate in the assault on Dakar, Senegal, that was to take place before the Free French landed there. A day later, on September 2nd, she landed at Gibraltar after leaving Scapa Flow, accompanied by four destroyers. She was eventually commissioned as the flagship of Vice Admiral John Cunningham, who commanded Force M. Four days after departing Gibraltar, Barham arrived in Freetown, Sierra Leone, bolstered by the battleship Resolution and the aircraft carrier Ark Royal from Force H. Covering the 7th and 15th cruiser squadrons as they sought Italian convoys in the central Mediterranean, the 1st Battle Squadron left Alexandria on the afternoon of November 24, 1941, with the Barham, Queen Elizabeth, and HMS Valiant in tow. The German submarine U-331, led by Oberleutnant Zur Z. Hans Diedrich von Teisenhausen, heard the faint rumble of the British ship's propellers the next morning and set out to intercept them. The submarines and 1st Battle Squadron traveled in the same direction by early afternoon. Therefore, Tiesenhausen gave the order to prepare for action at 1600 hours. The submarine was seen by an ASDIC operator on the leading destroyer HMS Jervis at 1618 at a range of 100 yards, but the contact was rejected since its apparent angle was between 40 and 60 degrees broad, significantly greater than a submarine. The leading ship, Queen Elizabeth, had already passed U-331 when the screen was breached and the second ship, the Barham, was swiftly closing. At 1600 hours 25 minutes, Tiesenhausen gave the order to fire all four bow torpedo tubes from a distance of 375 meters. After being hit, the boat dove uncontrollably to a depth of 265 meters, much deeper than her design depth limit of 150 meters, before regaining her composure and emerging unscathed. Tiesenhausen, although radio that he had struck a Queen Elizabeth-class battleship with one torpedo, he was unsure of the actual outcome of his strike. Three of the four torpedoes impacted amidships at such close range as to produce a single enormous column of water, leaving no opportunity for the ship to take evasive action. In just around four minutes after being torpedoed, the Barham overturned to port and sunk due to a catastrophic magazine explosion. The final explosion, according to the Board of Investigation investigating the sinking, was caused by a fire in the 4-inch magazines located ahead of the main 15-inch magazines, which subsequently spread to and exploded the contents of the main magazines. 862 officers and soldiers were killed, and two more died from their wounds after being rescued, all because of how quickly the ship fell. Vice Admiral Henry Pridham Whipple and the two soldiers who eventually died from their injuries were among the 337 survivors recovered by the destroyer HMS Hotspur, while the Australian destroyer Nizam allegedly saved 150 men. Jeffrey Cook, the ship's captain, perished along with his crew. A Pathé news cameraman aboard the Valiant could videotape the ship going down. The Board of Admiralty concealed all news of the loss of the Barham to keep the Germans in the dark and preserve British morale. The War Office informed the families of those lost after a delay of several weeks, but they asked that the news of the ship's destruction be kept secret from anyone but immediate family members, writing that it was most essential that information of the event which led to the loss of your husband's life should not find its way to the enemy until such time as it is announced officially. 
After repeated assertions by German radio, on January 27, 1942, the Admiralty formally acknowledged the loss, explaining that it was evident at the time that the enemy did not know that she had been destroyed and that it was vital to make specific dispositions before the loss of this ship was made public. When the Admiralty confessed that Barham had been sunk and revealed the circumstances, Tiesenhausen had no idea that he was responsible for her demise. As of that day, he was officially a Knight of the Iron Cross. A memorial bench honoring the crew was at Noth Gardens in Weymouth. After claiming to have spoken with the soul of a sailor from the sunken ship Barham, officials arrested Helen Duncan, the last person to be imprisoned under the Witchcraft Act of 1735. The HMS Barham story is one of sadness, a reminder of the tragedies and devastation of war. This once proud warship sank to the bottom of the Mediterranean in less than an hour after being hit by three torpedoes. While we may never know the identities of the 862 heroic people who lost their lives that day, we will never forget them. Although nothing can make up for the loss of life, we can honor those who sacrificed themselves for a cause larger than themselves by sharing their tales.